Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, Storm Chiara has been raging absolute havoc all over Northern Europe. You've seen some crazy approaches, some landings, and also some go-arounds. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Why is it that sometimes an aircraft will be taking off again after it seems like they're safely down on the ground? But first of all, we're going to talk about the new sub to transonic speed record over the Atlantic that was set by a British Airways Boeing 7 the other day, so stay tuned. Wind 31016, everyone right, right. Right, guys, so the reason I'm doing this video is because I am being inundated with messages on Twitter, which I'm hoping that you're following by now, uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and of course, the Mentor Aviation app. And they're all asking pretty much the same questions. Um, the most common questions have been, how come that a transonic aircraft like the Boeing 747 can fly quicker than the speed of sound over the Atlantic? Wouldn't that be dangerous? Wouldn't it you know, go over their maximum speed? What about when they're going into a jet stream or out of a jet stream, wouldn't they potentially hurt the airframe when they do that? Uh, we're going to be talking about that, but we're also going to be talking about the approaches that you see during these kind of severe storms. How is it that the pilots can actually decide to go around, even though it seems like they have been safely touched down already on the runway? But if we start with the new transonic speed record over the Atlantic. So a British Airways Boeing 747 managed to cross the Atlantic in only 4 hours and 56 minutes, which is an amazing speed. All right. The reason they were able to do that was because they used the help of an atmospheric phenomenon called a jet stream. So jet streams are very narrow bands of high speed winds that uh, normally during the winter, there tends to be two jet streams, the, the one up in the north, the arctic jet stream, and then the one that's going further down south. And the quickest one is always the one up in the north. These uh, jet streams are formed because there are different masses of air, hotter air and colder air. So the polar air where that meets up with the uh, slightly warmer air down south, it creates the, uh, um, the, the required changes in both pressure and temperature in order to produce these high winds. And the fact that the earth is rotating makes them always go from west to east. So there are always westerly winds in these jet streams. This is why you never see one of these speed records being, being done the other way when it's going from the UK to America. It's always been done when it comes from America to the UK and has to do with the direction of these uh, jet streams. So. So the aircraft, the 747 in this case, would have climbed into the jet stream somewhere over the um, um, coastline of America, in, over the Atlantic. And initially the passengers would have felt some buffeting, some, some turbulence. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily have been that bad. And as the aircraft climbed into the core of the jet stream, um, since there's not much wind different wind speeds rubbing up against each other since the wind is very homogeneous there um, there wouldn't have been much turbulence during the actual crossing and then as the aircraft is descending out of the jet stream there might have been some turbulence again but like i was saying it's not like the wind change is coming like this there would be a uh, what would be perceived as a constant increase in speed as the aircraft is coming out of the jet stream into slower air because the um, the the kind of movement the um uh, inertia of the aircraft is still moving very fast and as it moves into slower moving air it would be like an increase of headwind and an increase of indicated airspeed. So to a certain extent you have to be a little bit careful when you descend out of or climb into these jet streams. You have to monitor your speed very very carefully because you can have fairly sudden changes of indicated airspeed. But to answer the question that I've been asked whether or not it's dangerous and whether or not uh, they're increasing speeds above their maximum airspeeds? The answer to that is no, they're not. In fact, while we're in the jet stream, when we're traveling with it, in the cockpit, everything looks exactly normal. So if you think about it like if you're traveling on a boat, right? The actual speed of the boat, as in the speed that the boat is pushing through the water, it's going to be the same if it's going upstream or downstream. But if you're looking at it from 
you know, from the banks of the river, it will look like this, the boat is going much, much quicker when it's going downstream than it's going upstream. And it's the same kind of principle when the aircraft are flying in a jet stream. So the indicated airspeed that the pilots are seeing is the same as it always is. On a, uh, on a Boeing 747, they will probably be cruising at a Mach number of 0 0.80, 0 0.81, somewhere like that. And that hasn't changed whether they're in the jet stream or the outside of the jet stream. What does change is the ground speed. So that's the speed relative to the, um, the water underneath them. And that doesn't, from an aerodynamic point of view, doesn't have any kind of effect, okay? The only effect that has is how quickly they get from A to B, which is why the newspapers are making a huge deal of the fact that they now have a new speed record. But the pilots didn't do anything out of the ordinary. And they were basically just lucky that they managed to get into a pocket of air that was moving so fast that they could break this speed record, right? So, except for the fact that you have to be a little bit careful when you climb into and descend out of a jet stream, there is nothing dangerous with a, a crossing of that speed. Now, I did have some questions as well about what happens if you turn up at the gate at a busy airport two hours before you're supposed to be there. And that's a great question, actually. Um, it will cause a little bit of problems for ground staff. Um, if an air aircraft coming into Heathrow, for example, is turning up two hours before they're supposed to be there, because the gate that they should have been allocated might, be, might already be occupied at that point. So there is a possibility that these passengers might have had to sit and wait uh, on the taxiway until the gate is clear, or most likely they will be allocated a new gate and the passengers that are going outbound will get a gate change announcement. So that's most likely what will happen. Now, the other questions that I've received is, what about the other way then? If the speed was four hours and 56 minutes going over the Atlantic from America to the UK, what about the poor ones that had to go the other way? And that's true. They would have had a much, much longer flight, uh, probably more than two hours longer than that. But the thing with jet streams is that they're fairly localized. They're small. So there is a possibility to fly either above them or below them or even to some extent on the sides of them. And when the, the, um, the flight planning department is looking into this, they will be looking into, is there a possibility to go outside of this very, very strong headwind as they're flying over the Atlantic? And if there is, they will. So you can utilize the maximum speed of the jet stream when you're going with the wind, the tailwind, but you can also try to avoid the jet stream to a certain extent if you are going against the wind. So they wouldn't have managed to be, you know, to completely avoid the effects of the jet stream. It would have been a very, very long flight going the other direction. Um, but providing that they're flying an aircraft like, for example, the 747, which has a huge range, it's not an issue, right? They will take as much fuel as it's needed to fly those extra hours that it will take. And they will still have enough fuel for their diversion if they need to when they get to their destination and their minimum um, final reserve fuel. You can never dispatch with less than that. So those of you who, ans who asked, well, what about if you run out of fuel? That doesn't happen. If a flight is planned to fly a certain distance, we, the flight planning department, will always look at what kind of winds do we have? What are the atmospheric conditions? And make sure that you can carry as much fuel as you need. If you can't, if you're flying an aircraft that doesn't have uh, the endurance to fly for those extra hours, well, then the flight will be canceled or it will be moved to a different time when it is safe to do so. Everything that has to do with aviation guides is about safety and it is not happening by chance. We don't go for a flight and just hope that we'll get to our destination. No, no, that's not how it works. It is all very carefully planned before we ever depart. So don't worry about that. Now, the Storm Chiara um, also caused a lot of tricky conditions during landing and during takeoff. I've done several videos on that, right? So if you're interested, I'm gonna link to the, the videos up here, both how to do a crosswind takeoff correctly from a pilot's perspective and also how to do a crosswind landing because there are quite some techniques to it. But what I want to talk about today is the concept of stabilized approaches. So 
The pilots coming in during crosswind conditions like this, or during windy conditions like this, um, first of all, in their briefing, before they even started the descent, they would have briefed about the different techniques that they would have to use and the threats that comes with very gusty conditions. We also adjust our approach speed. So if we have very gusty conditions, we increase the approach speeds to have a lot of margin in case we would have a sudden increase in speed. Uh, during the approach or a decrease in speed because of the gust in the winds, okay? But then, as we're flying the approach, normally during the initial part of the approach, it's not really an issue. The turbulence will come as we get lower down because that's when the wind catches buildings or small hills and start creating these kind of rotors that creates the, the very bad turbulence that you can get sometimes. And now, it is over to the pilots to actually make sure that the aircraft is safely fl flying within all of their parameters during the, the, um, the approach. So the pilot flying will be concentrating on flying the aircraft. That's done either by autopilot, but if it's really severe, we probably disconnect the autopilot a bit earlier in order to feel the aircraft properly. Okay. The pilot monitoring has a hugely important job here because the pilot monitoring will be monitoring all of the instrumentation, making sure that we do not, do not exceed our approach speed, for example. If we do that, we might get flap blowback so that the flap will start to retract in order to protect themselves from structural damage. And if that happens, we have to go around. It's mandatory to do so. But also that the speed doesn't drop too low so that we approach our stall speed. We also have to make sure that we're staying in the slot, as in that we're flying within one dot localizer and one dot glide slope. And that's just to make sure that we don't suddenly become too high or too low on approach. Together with that, we also have rules about how much or how little thrust we can have for a prolonged period of time. So there's a lot of different things that the pilot monitoring has to look at when we're flying in tricky conditions like this. And at any time, if either the pilot flying or the pilot monitoring feels like, no, nope, I don't like this, I don't feel like I have control or we're outside of our stabilized criteria, any one of them can call go around. And the other pilot will respond appropriately. Right, so if the pilot monitoring, who might or might not be the first officer or the captain, calls, no, go around, the pilot flying only executes the go around. There's no question why, there's no nothing like that. You execute the go around, which is the safest thing to do, and then afterwards, you can talk about what the reason was. But it's most likely that the pilot monitoring will see something that the pilot flying does not see because he or she is so concentrated on getting the aircraft down to land, right? So when can you do a go around then? Well, you can do a go around at any stage during the approach before you've selected the thrust reverses. Right? So if you feel during the you know, initial part of the approach that something is wrong, uh, you get a master caution warning or something like that, you can stop the, uh, the approach at that point. During the intermediate and low part of the approach, you can go around whenever you feel like there is a reason to do so. And after landing, you can still go around providing that you haven't selected the thrust reversers. And the reason that the thrust reverser is the cutoff point is because it will take so long for the thrust reversers to stow themselves, for the thrust reverser locks to go into the position and for the engine to spool up, that if you're down on the ground and you've selected the thrust reversers and you select full thrust again, it's going to take you anything up to maybe 30, 40 seconds before you can start to get thrust back on the engine. And at that point, you will have decelerated so much and you will have um, used so much runway that it wouldn't be safe for you to try to go around again. So if you touch down, which we saw some examples of during Storm Chiara the other day, if you touch down and the, uh, the pilots feel that no, I don't like this. The aircraft is going towards the end of, or going towards the side of the runway, or I am not fully in control. You just press toga, go around, flap 15, set go around thrust. Very carefully rotate so that you don't hit the tail because that is a threat in this case. And then you go around and you do a, a second attempt. Now, of course, for you, the passengers in back. If you feel that you've touched down and all of a sudden it goes up again, especially after a really, really turbulent approach, it's going to feel very, very bad. But remember that the pilots are only acting on safety, right? If they feel that this is the safest course of action, this is what they would do. This is what they're trained to do. And pilots knows that there is a no blame policy for go around. This means that they do not have to answer up to why they did a go around. 
it's considered from an airline's point of view to be the safest option if they decide to go through with that. All right? Good. So the pilots are not going to be punished for doing a go around. That will never happen. The airlines will always assume that that was the best and the safest course of action. Okay? So that's why you will see these things. Now, if you guys are interested in seeing how a go around is done from inside of the cockpit, I actually have done in the Mentor Aviation app, I've done a Cat 3 approach and go around collection. So you can go in, you can get the Cat 3 approach and go around, you can use your smartphone, look around in the cockpit as I'm doing the whole approach and I'm doing the go around and also doing the landing from a Cat 3. That's a fog landing. And if you have one of these, which is a, uh, um, a Google Cardboard headset and you can put your phone inside. If you do, then you'll be able to switch over to VR mode and it will feel just like you're sitting inside of the cockpit together with me and my first officer when I do these um, exercises. And I have many, many more. I do a full setup from when it's cold and dark until it's ready to taxi. There is wind shear escape maneuvers. There's TCAS avoidance. There is engine failure after takeoff. All of that you can get inside of the Mentor Aviation app, but you can also get it absolutely for free, not pay anything and just be part of the community. So that's it guys. If you have any more questions, as always, put them in below or you can, um, you can contact me on Twitter or Instagram. I don't know if you noticed it, but I've started to do some Instagram TV posts as well. Now those are videos that I might not want to send out on the YouTube channel for whatever reason, like more personalized videos when I go out traveling and things like that. So follow me on Instagram if you haven't already. There are links to follow me on all of these social media here in the description. Have an absolutely fantastic day. And remember, subscribe, okay? And put the little notification bell on if you haven't already, because otherwise you might miss these special videos that I do from time to time. Take care of yourself and I'll see you next time. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.